first thing is to welcome you all today for our next session on the celebration of faculty careers. Um, I'm the, an Associate Dean for Engineering and I'm here on behalf of Dean Leah Jameson to welcome you to this event and to do a brief introduction here of, of Professor Kalakai. So this celebration of faculty careers actually originated as a recommended activity out of the engineering strategic plan, which at the time was called Faculty of 2020. And the idea out of that initiative was to focus on uh, professional development and also the evolving scope of activities within the college. So part of that discussion was a post-promotion review for full professors where they would have a chance to reflect back, identify their accomplishments, and even at the full professor level, talk about what kinds of things they might plan for the future. So now, it started in 2013 as a pilot project. It is now, um, we're now in 2017, and it's uh, fully implemented within the college. So faculty, at least seven years past uh, promotion to full professor, get this opportunity to uh, share. <laughs> Um, and so today we're going to have uh, a Stephen do it. It has evolved so that I think a lot of faculty who have participated in this event have decided that it was very interesting to look back but also to look ahead. So our focus today is Professor Collicott. He received his PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford University. Year was blank. <laughs> After you. <laughs> well, true. <laughs> His research interests include low gravity fluid dynamics, experimental fluid mechanics, and optical diagnostics. He's an associate fellow of AIAA. He's also for Aero and Astro, the associate head for engagement and a professor in our school. So given that really brief summary, I'll let you continue and you know, give us more information about yourself and your plans. For the Great. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Thank you much. Thanks, everybody, for coming uh, to listen. I've had an um, enjoyable time preparing this talk. Um, this, I, I realize I've spent 27 years uh, pursuing an obscure corner of the fluid dynamics world, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, what that is. All right. Um, Somehow I missed out on uh, time to talk about what I want to do in the future, so this is uh, really bringing you up to date to where I am. Now, many of you know I play around with um, zero gravity experiments, and the experiment is working really well in the back, so Sasha and Wills and I came up front here in the airplane to play. Um, this was in February. So you guys know I, I like to do these uh, vomit comet flights where we get 20 to 25 seconds of uh, low gravity for, uh, for testing work. And um, that uh, every time I show that video, two uh, notions come to mind. One is it's proof every now and then you can teach an old dog a new trick or uh, modifying a TV commercial from decades ago about I, I'm not an astronaut, but I play one on TV. So, um, and then some of you also know I've had the great pleasure of being involved with a space station fluids experiment. And here's a video of the, I'll show you the two hour experiment. Uh, fortunately, it's sped up 64 times. Um, this launched in 2006. I got to design this uh, vein gap experiment for my good friend Mark Weiss Logal of Portland State University, who was principal investigator on this program. And it's this unusual be wicking behavior of liquids in weightlessness that drives a lot of our research. These red fingers of liquid flowing up in this left to right asymmetry um, are all physical phenomena that are present in liquids here on Earth, but gravity overwhelms them, so we never see them. But when we get up into orbit or longer duration space flight, um, we talk about zero gravity. I know gravity is still there or a space station wouldn't stay in its orbit, but it's just, just a very descriptive term for weightlessness. Um, these phenomena become the dominant factors in positioning liquid propellants uh, in, in spacecraft uh, fuel tanks and other spacecraft systems. 
Okay, so that what you're looking at is about the size of a commuter travel mug. And you see you don't get the flat coffee surface, you get the big curved meniscus that's indicative of the, uh, the weightlessness. There's a second generation of this payload that went up. I didn't design it, but my old PhD student did, so I still feel nicely involved, okay? So those are some fun kind of real highlights of what I do, but as I was putting this together, you know, it's, uh, those are kind of little moments in my career. So I came here uh, in 1960. Um, I lived in Hilltop Apartments up here behind the press box. And um, it took me a long time to get my first proposal out. But um, some of you, I know uh, Gus knows Hank and Jess Sheely, a uh, longtime communications professor and lecturer here, and they were our neighbors uh, over there in Hilltop. Now they live in Hills and Dales, so it's taken them 55 years to go a half mile. Um, so yeah, I, I was born in Home Hospital in Lafayette and spent the first few months of my life here. Uh, at Purdue. Um, I got started on this work uh, right away. But my path here, um, really, as a kid in school, the logical topics, like perhaps many of us, uh, were my strongest. I gravitated towards those, mathematics and uh, grade school, drafting in junior high and high school, and the physical sciences in high school. But growing up, I was always building many toys we had in the house for uh, constructing things, and that uh, typewriter also. The, um, one day uh, at dinner, we were family dinner, and my mom said, well, you were, I must have been about eight years old. She said, you were really quiet downstairs this afternoon. What were you up to? And I said, oh, I said, oh, well, I took your typewriter apart and I put it back together. And um, it caused quite a commotion. Um, and I remember very well thinking at that moment, Wow, I'm glad I didn't tell them about the first time I did that. <laughs> um, so I've always been a tinkerer, I guess. And I can recall some of the Gemini missions, watching them on television, the excitement over that. And I can recall the, the, uh, the moon landings, watching uh, uh, Armstrong and Aldrin step onto the moon when I was eight years old, right exactly where I was and which house we lived in and, and which direction I was facing. Uh, that was just so exciting. I don't know how anybody my age grew up to be a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist or anything else. I mean, the space race was so exciting to me. Um, I had really had some applied fluid dynamics experience in my teen years, uh, racing s small sailboats. And then uh, Academy of Model Aeronautics, AMA, Cap Academy of Model Aeronautics competitions uh, towards the end of high school, uh, taught me craftsmanship, patience, and I say memorizing rules for aerodynamics. Okay, your airplane needs to balance uh, just behind the quarter cord point, why? Well, so it'll fly better, why? Well, that's how they fly better. Um, so <laughs> certainly until things like uh, what we have here, Aero 333, 334, then I started to learn why um, these things happen. So there's a uh, girder and panel, I had this, um, Sky rail set, these cheap plastic uh, battery holders with switches didn't work at all, so I was really disappointed until I realized you could just take uh, E batteries from some other toy and uh, wire them up and uh, move that around. Erector sets, uh, played with constantly. Lincoln logs, in the younger years, they obviously limit your creativity compared to uh, other things. Um, in later years, um, I did learn that those these really small pieces really were good for throwing at the back of your brother's head. Um, tinker toys, I did a lot with in my youth. Model aeronautics, uh, that was uh, 1979 Michigan championship. I had hair. <laughs> right, how about that? Um, I still have a trophy from third place in half a gas free flight. I didn't win anything with that hand launch glider. Uh, but that was fun activities on the sailing. Uh, here on the left, uh, I'm in the water, and that's uh, Jill on the bow and Chris in the cock. No, Chris on the bow, Jill in the cockpit. Uh, we were competing in some youth event, and here you see I'm holding this massive trophy while three other skippers are holding some embarrassingly small uh, trophies. So that was the type of uh, sailboat racing I grew up doing 
in Michigan where the lakes are clear and cool and deep. So I grew up in Ann Arbor and my dad said, uh, go to Michigan, I'll pay for it. Do whatever you want, you pay for it. So I went to Michigan. That was easy. Um, I got exposure to experiments working as a woodcarver and machinist for the Naval Testing Tank for the Naval Architecture School at Michigan. And then um, the AAA student chapter in Arrow at Michigan would organize a spring break trip in those days. I don't know if Heaster ever went on one. But um, we took a uh, trip out to Aerojet in Sacramento, Lockheed Missiles in Space in Sunnyvale, NASA Ames in Mountain View, and United Technologies Chemical Systems Division had a rocket test facility down south of San Jose. Uh, and that trip actually led to my uh, first summer internship, uh, 1981, with Lockheed Missiles in Space in Sunnyvale working on, that was my first zero gravity fluids uh, experience, working on propellant management systems for satellites and missiles. Uh, the next summer, uh, after junior year, I interned at McDonnell Douglas Research Labs down in St. Louis, thanks to Professor Tom Adamson, who happens to be an outstanding aerospace engineer from Purdue. Um, I got the research bug and I went back there another year before grad school too. And in senior year, I, I really a uh, directed study project I did with Bill Wilmarth uh, really boosted my confidence and uh, that was cool. One important part here, Jim Driscoll was a young assistant professor at Michigan. And at one point I asked him if I want a career in fluids research, what topics should I pursue? And I think he actually scratched his chin a little bit like this even, and then said, you know, if you become an expert in two-phase flows, you'll never be short of work. And that's like here, two-phase flows are not part of an aero curriculum. So I went to the engineering library, got some books, and started reading, and decided that's way too messy. I want nothing to do with two-phase flows, all right? Went on to grad school. Um, got my master's in nine months at Stanford. Uh, that was hard work. Uh, it was only at the end of nine months that I realized that my fellowship was actually good for 12 months. And, and I could have uh, put off a class or two till the summer. But anyway, I got started on my PhD. Uh, I worked with Bert Hesselink, who's now a, actually an uh, electrical engineering professor there. On, um, there you have it, laser speckle velocimetry with photorefractive recording and anamorphic optical processing. What a mouthful. Um, and it turns out that uh, at that same time, uh, another velocimetry technique card called particle image velocimetry, or PIV, was also being developed. And as the years went by, we've learned that PIV is, is always a better choice than laser speckle velocimetry. So what I spent years and years working on turned out to be really not practical. But man, I learned a ton. I learned a lot. I learned a lot in... Um, image processing, I learned a lot in optics, optical design, I learned a lot in linear systems, I learned a lot in fluid mechanics, it was really a great experience. And it's not just the professors, but uh, the, I realized what really pleased me was the people I was working with and studying with uh, there were, were really impressive. Um, so that was a very good experience and um, got me the job here. So another Hesselink student, Ray Snyder, was doing optical tomography in um, compressible flows for his thesis research. And, and Ray's girlfriend had a friend, and some of you know Jennifer. So this picture is about a week or two after we became engaged in early 89. So uh, they're at Stanford. So that's an important part of my life. And um, Jennifer, yeah, I had hair then too. <laughs> Forehead's getting a little high. Yeah. <laughs> The beard's another story. Um, I injured a knee skiing and I got bored, so I grew a beard. I don't know. It's, um, so yeah, Jennifer wanted to come here, but her job out at Harrison High School kept her uh, from visiting you today. So we were married not long after this, uh, right after the Loma Prieta earthquake, 10 days, and that's a whole other story too. We got married by Plan E, thanks to the earthquake. And uh, anyway, so I came here. New Year's Day of 91, we flew here. All right, the next day, January 2nd, I started work. I remember Skip Grant was head and Skip brought me the hard copy. There was no Enspires, there was no grants.gov, there was no World Wide Web. He brought me the hard copy of the 
National Science Foundation Engineering Research Equipment Grant Program solicitation. I said, young man, you probably ought to apply to get a proposal into this. So I started writing that proposal. Uh, Henry Yang was head. Uh, he was an inspirational guy. Um, and uh, so I'm very grateful. And uh, rumor has it John, John Sullivan's not here. Rumor had, I've heard scuttlebutt, John had something to do with, with me rising to the top of the list, so I'm very grateful for that. So, Steve Heaster, Steve Schneider, Mario Rotia, Greg Blaisdell, Nate Messersmith, uh, Lee Peterson, Tom Ferris, Jim Munguski, Horacio Espinosa, and perhaps a few more assistant professors all came in 12 to 18, 24 month period. So the department became pretty young right away. Uh, I, my first office phone, I, would, I got the phone number for, I think it was when uh, Professor Kenser retired, so I'd still get, when I, my first couple years, I'd get phone calls for Paul Kenser on my office phone. My lab uh, was 37 out at Aerospace Sciences Lab. I'm not quite sure who's using it now. And um, I want to preview uh, two things here. Why do I have conclusions early in the talk? I want to get these into your mind. Um, these are inescapable conclusions for me. Uh, research and teaching are, are almost always linked. Uh, when people say, how much time do you spend researching and teaching? I say, I don't know. They're not independent. And um, the other theme here I want you to keep in mind is I do my best work with other people. That's another conclusion here. So building research at Purdue, early on I was thinking back, uh, like many colleagues, the uh, Air Force Summer Faculty Program was a uh, very useful step. Growing out of that, I, got a, I went over to Wright Labs for the summer of 92. And um, um, that led to a small grant for evaluating the focusing Schlieren optical method in aerodynamics. It also introduced me to John Schmisher, who had just completed his master's at Texas and was going to go to Princeton for his PhD. But we talked him into coming here instead. And uh, John went on to be um, Steve Schneider's PhD student and on and on to uh, hypersonics program manager for the Air Force and uh, now as a professor at, at another school. Uh, back then I also had a small grant from a place called the Engineering Foundation, which I've never heard of since, um, to explore Rayleigh scattering of light uh, near a wind tunnel model. Uh, Rayleigh scattering is what makes the sky blue. It's a very weak process and it's very, we had to find out how close to a wind tunnel body could we use Rayleigh scattering as an effective uh, diagnostic tool. And uh, Joe McGuire, who's now at Intelsat, uh, was my student on that. Uh, the first large grant I was involved in was with Steve Schneider, again working with somebody, uh, on his uh, Mach 4 quiet flow Ludwig tube, which has been torn down and scrapped. Uh, the Mach 6 is highly successful now, but that was the uh, his start of uh, funded research in uh, quiet flow hypersonics, and it was fun to be a part of that and looking at developing the um, laser perturber and the laser differential interferometer uh, in support of his work. And Terry Sawyer worked on that in his PhD and John Schmisher. Uh, my first zero G money came from Lockheed Palo Alto Research uh, in support of the Gravity Probe B program. And um, Rob Bate and Scott Courtney uh, were master's students uh, working on that. Rob wrote his thesis on it. It was just hourly work for Scott, but he's obviously done well uh, since then. And uh, early on there, I forget exactly what year, I loaned uh, my lab to Heaster and uh, his student Mike Moses to do some low-speed liquid jet breakup work, and uh, that went well. We got a paper out of it. Mike got a th thesis out of it. Um, and Mike is now the new president of the Virgin Galactic Company and one of our OAEs. I got a career award early on. I was one of Purdue's very first career award winners because prior to my year it was called something else. Okay, so, and I'll tell you how old I am. Uh, my career award proposal included the statement, this World Wide Web thing will never catch on. <laughs> Fortunately, that had nothing to do with, with the research I was proposed, and it's because of Steve Heaster complaining that I got this successful proposal. Uh, Steve was doing some modeling work in cavitation in diesel fuel injectors and was complaining about the lack of data. It turns out it's a very difficult, um, there's good reason there was no data. It's a very difficult problem 
uh, experimentally. Uh, it's difficult to scale. There's too many different things going on from particulate content, number density of particulates, and dissolved gas in the oil, and the, and the uh, size and shape of the particulates, and the surface roughness, and, and bluntness of the whole inlet, and all these other things. Um, there's no way to scale it. It's not just Reynolds number, Mach number, um, pressure coefficient. So we were motivated to go to true scale, true pressure. And that meant eight thousandths of an inch diameter and 30,000 PSI pressure. So at the top of these holes is 30,000 PSI, at the bottom is atmospheric. Um, and these are six to eight times as long as they are in diameter. So they're very small holes. And we went through a number of methods to create these such small holes drilled at a 14 or 70 degree angle. I forget, Cummins had 14, I think, and Caterpillar 17 or something like that. Um, and indeed, we, we got this, this flow vis, and we're able to look at and, and determine three types of cavitation going on in, in these orifices. And um, my student, uh, Haiyun Lee, was my first PhD to finish. He worked in this. Master students, Mark Henry, Budi Chandra, Paul Sanchez, all did great work. And our alum, uh, Wayne Eckerly down at Cummins, uh, was a big help uh, with this, and I think with Steve's work too, he would, he would say. So that was really fun. Um, I did some other work too. This is a cavitating slot flow, uh, just under a millimeter width. Mark Henry took this picture a couple nights after I told him, don't waste your time, that'll never work. So fortunately, I had a persistent student in Mark. And uh, we learned a lot also from Paul Soika here in ME. But in that decade or so, I've really, man, it was uh, getting the sprays community to accept that there were a wealth of sub-diameter length scale flow structures in the orifice that cause velocity perturbations at the exit of the, of the spray hole that then affects how the spray breaks up um, was really difficult. Uh, we were getting pictures like this. Uh, people in Germany and Japan were getting data. But um, I just got tired of pushing against this. Um, proposals and journal submissions will get the same, I, I thought, misguided critical comments. And um, it really was a surprising lesson that sometimes researchers don't like new ideas. Okay, except for the Ford engineers. And um, they were only interested if I could promise them everything would be very cheap. And they said, you know, we make a fuel injector for this much money. And I said, no, I just put one into my Taurus. It cost me 10 times that much. They said, yeah, yeah, it'll cost you that much, but this is what we make it for. Um, so I didn't get involved with low cost automotive systems there. So I wandered away from cavitation and spray systems. Um, came back years later. These, these are what I think are still very exciting images that Enrique Portillo uh, acquired in his PhD research, uh, working with Greg Blaisdell. So like Heister and Mike Moses earlier, I loaned my lab and offered experti expertise uh, on the high-speed liquid jet instability. And um, now Guillermo Jaramillo, my PhD student, uh, one of our Colombians, is advancing the instability analysis and computations for his work and actually did a PhD summer intern last summer for Enrique at the uh, Siemens uh, Gen Engine Company. So this, um, again, working with other people uh, has kept up uh, and we get really good things. Before Enrique's thesis, it's safe to say that high-speed jet instability modeling relied very heavily on about two or three images from decades ago, uh, Hoyt and Taylor. And this is just one page out of Enrique's thesis and we got a lot more data and now Guillermo is, is doing some good pencil pushing and computations uh, to back that up. So I got, I wandered into zero gravity fluid dynamics. Nobody else here was really doing it on campus. I'd had that background in 81 at Lockheed Martin, well, it was Lockheed then. Uh, so what is unique about zero G fluids? Well, if it's all gas or all liquid in a container, that's boring, we don't wanna deal with that. It's the two-phase problems uh, that are of interest. 
And uh, the difference is capillary effects, wicking that is, uh, dominate, wicking and wetting dominate over large length scales in orbit. Um, a uh, modern communication satellite has a main hydrazine tank nine feet tall, three feet diameter, and wicking positions uh, up to 3,000 pounds of propellant uh, in that tank. You take away gravity, the next biggest thing on the, in this problem is wicking. It's still a weak force relative to gravity, so things happen slower. Um, and actually, if you get to zero-g fluid statics, the positioning of the liquid in, in equilibrium, it turns out the densities of the liquid and the gas and the viscosities of the liquid and gas and the surface tension of the interface between them don't matter. The zero gravity fluid statics comes down to a geometry problem, the container geometry and the contact angle of the liquid on the solid. Uh, if you think you've probably learned hydrophilic and hydrophobic in, in high school chemistry or biology, that's kind of the limits. Uh, there's actually a continuum of wetting behavior from zero contact angle, which is really good wetting, to 180 degree contact angle, which is complete non-wetting. A uh, liquid would rather form a ball than sit on the surface. So where the, a given liquid and solid falls on that spectrum and the container geometry determine the uh, equilibrium state of the liquid and gas in the container. This is not what CFD is good at. CFD is good at motion. If you keep trying to solve for a zero velocity field, CFD generally um, gets angry. So um, we have to do something else. The other problem here is contact angle is a lie. We use it, it's a useful lie, but it is a crude macroscopic approximation to a really dynamic molecular motion in, in the region where the liquid meets the, the edge of the liquid meets the solid and the gas is there too. Um, so we know it's a lie, but we use it. And once the liquid starts moving, it's even worse of a lie. Um, the stick slip motion, if you go home tonight and start putting water down on a plate, uh, you'll see you don't, it doesn't expand as a perfectly circular uh, droplet of water. Parts of it expand and faster than others and hold up and advance. And it's really a nonlinear process. And so once the fluid is motion, in motion, contact angle is uh, doubly a lie. Uh, but we're cursed with this, okay? We, th there's really no way out of this. Um, until you can do molecular dynamics for uh, 3,000 pounds of liquid, uh, we're kind of stuck here. So I got involved early on with Gravity Probe B in the early 90s. Um, this uh, satellite was in a polar orbit and uh, was conducting a test of general, two tests of general relativity, which I don't understand. It was built around a 2,500 liter Dewar for liquid helium. Okay, that's what a 2,500 liter spaceflight doer looks like on the outside. Inside, there's this yellow post down the middle. Inside that post was where the, the relativity experiment, the five ultra-precise gyroscopes and the star tracker uh, looking out the end uh, and all the sensors were located. My work was outside of that. Between the yellow post and the wall is, is the doer. That's where the liquid helium sat. Okay, and this whole satellite spun, that's probably still spinning, it's out of helium, but it's probably still spinning, uh, around the axis of symmetry of that, okay? So it's a spinning satellite. And the question was, how fast do you spin to get a vapor bubble to wrap all the way around that post? If it's spinning, that wants to throw the dense stuff, the liquid, out to the edge so the vapor runs into the middle into the post. And there's a little cartoon of low spin on the left going to high spin on the right, showing that as you spin faster, the bubble gets wrapped farther and farther around the post um, until it transitions to a toroidal, or the topology of a toroid, torus there. Um, it's a great case where Buckingham Pi theorem saves you a lot of work. Um, this non-dimensionalized spin rate of interest turns out to depend only on non-dimensional bubble volume and spin rate, or contact angle, rather, sorry. And uh, so our job was to do a 1G experiment and test surface evolver code in 1G. So this picture on the left is out early, early output of the surface evolver computer model. The one thing um, I'm aware of that will do a good job with capillary fluid statics uh, 
for general contact angle, has great volume conservation, and, and it's a surface mesh, so it's just intrinsically faster than a volume mesh. On the right is a photograph. Uh, we couldn't digitize photographs at high res back then. Um, well, that's actually off of video, low res video, uh, showing a bubble in the top of this uh, 1G experiment. And so we were able to then compare computations. That's the SE results, surface evolver results. We got four squares there and then a bunch of experimental results. You know, these days it would be the other way around. We would have, with the computers now, 23 years later, how many cycles of Moore's Law is that? Um, we would have a continuous curve of computational results. <laughs> so it worked. and. Um, that was great. Then they launched it. So that was 94. We were doing that work. It launched in 2004, and it worked, but only after a scare. I was uh, sitting at my uh, office out at the airport, what's now Professor Bain's office, and I uh, got an email saying, how sure are you of those uh, bubble wrapping speeds? And uh, that started a discussion. But 10 years before, the Gravity Pro B program had chosen not to model the dynamics of this transition process, only model the statics. And so they never really understood ahead of time how long this process can take. So you're spinning up 2,500 liters of an exceedingly low viscosity liquid, and that takes tens of thousands of revolutions, and this tank was spinning maybe at 0.1 RPM. So you just have to be patient. It'll get there. It takes weeks and weeks. And then uh, the bubble popped to the symmetric state, and they were very happy. An asymmetric bubble puts the liquid mass center off of the spin axis, and so you get a wobble in the spin. That was the interest in the symmetric bubble. So this was my first use of the surface evolver code. Um, I didn't write it. Professor Ken Brackey at Susquehanna University in mathematics wrote it um, for minimal surface theory research. And in Euclidean three space, that is capillary problems. Um, it was fun. The next summer, uh, Stephen Crawtheim, uh, as an undergrad, did a summer project on this. Uh, it was one of those things where you, s you tell yourself at the end, boy, if I were to do that experiment again, I would do it this way instead. And he walked in, so we did it again, and we got even better results. Um, kind of transitioned into then more work with Lockheed. I went out to Lockheed Martin commercial space in 98 on sabbatical and um, got involved with the uh, propulsion group out there for commercial satellites and these satellites are millions of dollars a month revenue in orbit and they're up in geosynchronous orbit 23,000 miles up and the owners want to know when they're going to run out of fuel so uh, Boris Yendler and I worked together uh, some of you have met Boris and Boris is actually on our uh, list now as a um, uh, adjunct professor, I believe. And um, we developed a uh, thermal-based uh, propellant gauging method for these type of satellites, and um, we think uh, it is the best. Well, on the ground, there's some people in the lower right. This is what a, uh, a big geosynchronous communication satellite looks like on the ground looks something like that after it's launched and up in orbit that's a, a rendering by an artist we don't have cameras up there to take beautiful pictures of them um, and the artists always want to put some blue sky 23,000 miles up too so but at least it tells you which way it's pointing right you know earth is in the lower left here and it's pointing towards the earth I think those are 25 foot diameter antennas on ASIS I think it's now called Garuda and serves Indonesia with telephone service um, geosynchronous isn't great for telephone, but if your nation has 3,000 islands and you want to connect them all, uh, satellite's still the cheapest way. We've done on-orbit rebalancing of fuel loads. Uh, here's a cartoon showing a, a four-tank propulsion system, lots of fuel in three of them, very little fuel in one tank, and um, we went at this. Um, and the PGS here is propellant gauging system. Uh, detected this imbalance, 
and then looked at ways to turn heaters on and off differently on different tanks to thermally pump liquid back to the uh, mostly empty tank. If that empty tank had gone dry, there was kind of a short circuit for the pressure gas to flow out to space and basically the uh, lifetime of the satellite was over. But by rebalancing it, um, we were able to extend the life and uh, that was very good. And let's see here, what we got here, uh, at least six months on two satellites and remember it's millions of dollars a month per satellite. And a quote here from our customer, Lockheed Martin Commercial Space Systems, provided unique propellant gauging and fuel management expertise and tools to support this important challenge. In particular, our president and CEO highlighted that by extending the life of the spacecraft, uh, their efforts saved the company significant money by delaying traffic transfer to the new satellite. Um, so this has been a lot of fun, uh, doing some work, low gravity fluids work with industry, and then doing some low gravity fluids work research, like you saw the space station experiment. So that was a good experience in 98, and I still have consulting work coming out of that. Thanks to some Lockheed Martin people, uh, Boris in the upper right, many of you have met. Cetridge Crawford was my uh, direct boss there. He's also a pilot and an uh, automobile nut. Um, Craig Purcell and the late Jack Divers uh, were, were a big help too. And man, it was really fun. I worked with three people I'd had in class in the first seven years I was at Purdue. It was very rewarding to see what Jennifer, Derek, and Lance uh, were doing just a few years out of Purdue AAE. Uh, that was a lot of fun. So about that time, just the year before that, I got involved with Zero G experiments. And uh, Chet Kumar and Michelle Lucas, Michelle was really the instigator, uh, came to me and said, look, there's this new NASA program for students to build experiments and fly them in Vomit Comet, and uh, you should be our advisor. And I was worried about getting tenure, so I told them I couldn't afford to get involved in an educational activity. I said, talk to Professor Heaster. And he, he, he brushed them off. I said, <laughs> I think I tried a couple times to get rid of them. And Chet and Michelle just kept, kept coming back. And I said, OK, great. Let's do it. Um, it looks interesting. So there's uh, Chet and Michelle in flight. There was a, a four-person student team. That's a, an original experiment free floating in the vehicle. It's actually the only free floater I've ever done. They're a big nuisance as opposed to bolting down to the floor um, on a uh, ideas for uh, a two-dimensional capillary dominated slosh experiment that we were hoping to fly in something like a getaway special can on shuttle um, and it's something that now for 20 years I've been teaching and has become a major part of my career here at Purdue all because of these two persistent students since then We've had 200 students in waitlessness. Most of them have loved it. We've had 30 students going to suborbital launches or integration visits with rocket companies to get our payloads integrated with the rocket or to perform that. We've had 50 student, Purdue has had 50 student experiments in Vomit Comet. Um, I brought in $6 million worth of parabolic flight tests. I never set out to do that. I sent them away the first time, silly me. Um, beginning in 2009, we started doing suborbital rocket payloads for the, what then was the, the emerging commercial suborbital rocket industry. We also had a NASA-funded student space station experiment for a couple years. NASA canceled that and a bunch of others like it. Um, 15 suborbital payloads we've launched or we have under construction right now in 418 for a wide range of rockets, and we've brought in uh, $1.5 million worth of suborbital rocket flights, either gratis from the companies or through the NASA Flight Opportunities, Flight Opportunity Grants out of Space Flight Technology Mission Directorate. And we have young alums from this class donating to help fund student travel to the current activities, which I think is just really cool. Here's a group at our very first Armadillo launch. Uh, that can on the left is actually a lunar lander style rocket from Armadillo. Um, 
I can't remember everybody's name, but Jeremy Voigt, second from the left, is now an uh, engineer at XCore Aerospace. Um, here we are at uh, a few of these people, are Purdue students and I. I'm right in the middle in the gold shirt. Um, this is uh, after the first FAA licensed commercial suborbital launch at New Mexico Spaceport America. We had a payload, Aero 418 payload on this rocket with Armadillo Aerospace. This, uh, this and a number of aeros Armadillo launches were given to us. Um, companies want to try to learn to work with researchers. They want the Purdue name involved with their business. And so this works out really well for uh, our students and I. In June, we had the great thrill of being at the fourth successful flight of the Blue Origin New Shepard rocket. Um, many of you here may know George and Brian, two of our students. They helped, uh, they were part of the team that helped finish up the experiment that went in the crew capsule. Uh, that sat on top of that booster. That booster landed about 45 minutes before this picture. Uh, go to YouTube, watch their video. It's very, very impressive. There we are with the crew capsule. Our experiment's inside there. That's after the landing. Um, if you look at the uh, little scrub brush on the right and the tufts of grass and cacti on the ground, it's obviously a fairly gentle landing. It didn't, doesn't look like a blast zone or anything. And for those of you anticipating uh, personal space flight, those gray rectangles on the next capsule are windows, the largest windows in space flight history. And six people will fly in this capsule. Save your money, okay? It's going to be really cool. I've even done children's television as a result of this suborbital. Uh, this Friday zone is at down in Bloomington. They said, the faculty here might appreciate this. They said, um, Professor Turpin, Tom Turpin was here a couple months ago. He was great. All you need to do is be like Professor Turpin. <laughs> and I, I think there's very few people on the planet who can be like Professor Turpin. So that was actually a real challenge to me. They thought they were calming me, but it uh, didn't. We have a second great experiment going up this summer on Blue Origin. The uh, Zero Gravity Glow Experiment with Cumberland School up here on the north side of West Lafayette. Second graders wanted to know if fireflies would light up in the space station. So we're doing an experiment and launching it. With uh, Blue Origin and NanoRacks, any school in the country can buy a spot on a flight for $5,300, which is about the third the cost of football uniforms. Every school district in this country that plays football can afford K-12 space flight, and we're setting out to prove it. So this is a lot of fun. And my eldest daughter, who's studying graphic design, uh, did the uh, mission patch for us. So I'm very pleased with that. A little feedback on this. I don't know if you guys can read this. There's not enough time to have you read it. But in 2010, NASA's associate administrator, in her keynote address to the uh, Suborbital Researchers Conference, said these are the kinds of things NASA should be doing that we say we're doing and that the president asked us to do. Um, so the number two person at NASA has taken note of, of 418. Of course, she's no longer with NASA, but that's the level uh, we're, we're getting noticed at. Uh, three quotes from alums uh, talking about, let's just uh, the, look at the end of the first one. In the end, I think that Aero 418, even without the flight itself, was easily the most valuable course I took at Purdue. Um, the uh, second one was an aero student who then went into finance after some years at NASA and um, talks about people are always impressed with the opportunities he had at Purdue because of things like 418. And if you read closely, you'll see he's saying he's um, having the ability to help send other Purdue students on this wonderful life experience was a pleasure. Uh, he, he had one of our big kickoff donations in, uh, in our fundraising. And uh, the bottom one, he talks about, you know, in my job interview, I talked about your class. And um, I've heard from any number of corporate recruiters that students having the ability to talk about things like this when they're interviewing really sets them apart from the pack. And the bottom line, uh, my friends uh, Ricard Gonzalez in Barcelona and John Kuhlman at West Virginia have also started classes like 418. But I keep going with the research, too. 
All right, so this is a case where the, yeah, I, it's a class I'm supposed to be teaching, but everything we do revolves around zero gravity fluids research um, and then leads into other things. And just to, I think this is my latest uh, zero G publication using this um, specialized capillary code to uh, look at uh, fluid stability questions and spinning spacecraft devices. This grows out of work with, uh, of my friend's work, uh, Michael Dreyer, at, who I left out the first E, Michael Dreyer at uh, the ZARM, the big drop tower in Bremen, Germany, and Dr. Yvonne Chen, um, her PhD work. Uh, then I, I jumped ahead based on this. Um, there's some other interesting, fun things we looked at with, uh, so you have in a symmetric tank, let's say it's a cylinder with hemisphere ends, there are some sheet metal veins inside that create corners for wicking to control the liquid. Um, and uh, we've always, in the early days of computers, we chopped up, let me use this, you see this uh, pie slice here by my cursor? Oh, you don't see my cursor, do you? Ah, that's fun. Okay. Uh, the two bottom ones have a one-eighth of the circle sector. We would often just compute that one-eighth sector and using symmetry planes, you could replicate around, get the whole symmetric solution. But implications from that gravity probe B work with the asymmetric bubble on a circular post, and then some uh, other really nice mathematical work by Paul Conkus and Bob Finn. Paul's a mathematician at uh, Berkeley and Livermore Labs. Um, probably in his 80s now. Bob Finn is a mathematician at Stanford. He's 94. Over the holidays, uh, we were, he's at it. He's, he's going at it still at 94. Um, letters to a journal editor about somebody copying our work, perhaps, and this kind of stuff. So a very impressive uh, pair of gentlemen. Um, kind of led us to believe, well, we should look at asymmetric solutions in symmetric geometries. And indeed, here's an example for central vein tanks. Uh, just a quick picture of three different bubble, a top view, three different bubble shapes for the same uh, um, gas fraction in the tank. And so then in the edge vein, then there's a, it looks similar. And the plot here, you see there's a purple and a blue. And um, it's hard to see the parts of the blue because it's pretty much overwritten with the, with the purple or pink. And that's why I put it up here, because what, one of the things we learned was that, for example, these three solutions top, shown from top view here have very, very similar energies for these equilibrium solutions. And the bad news about that is that one little thing in the vehicle or the mission can cause the liquid or the bubble to pop into different geometries, and that will give you mass center anomalies. It will cause problems where, like on this one right above me here, if you have, um, there are heaters, strip heaters put on these tanks to keep the hydrazine from freezing. And if you think you're heating a, a tank wall that's coated with hydrazine, but it actually has a helium bubble in front of it, uh, the temperatures can go quickly go way above what you uh, ever intended the tank to survive. So it's a lot of uh, fun stuff, interact, you know, the intersection of, of research and working in industry in this obscure corner. So what have I learned about obscure corners? There are pros. You don't have many competitors. That's good. You get to know them. That's usually good. Um, there's a lot of work you can, a lot of things, a lot of what you do really, you find yourself going back to basic principles and uh, working with dimensional analysis and symmetry and duality of solutions and things like this and, and just looking at how, how you can charge ahead. Uh, the companies, uh, get to know your name quickly, uh, that's handy. And there's no firmly entrenched old guard uh, to give you these uh, sniping uh, reviews on proposals and journal submissions. The bad news is there's no dependable, well-supported computational tool for what you want to do. Uh, Surface Evolver works great. Um, I teach it in 518 here. Um, and the reason it's maintainable is because it's a DOS interface, keystroke, old-fashioned uh, keystroke interface. One guy wrote it. Uh, the other bad news is students don't arrive in my classes really with any background at all in the topic because our curriculum doesn't address it because very few of our students will end up working in it. 
It makes sense. Research grants can be scarce. Citation count will be low. Your H factor will be low. Your grant total might be low. Your number of PhDs will be low. And um, that's, that's not a good thing around the university usually. Uh, and your field gets ignored a lot until it becomes a problem. And then when it's a problem, there's no time to do research. But really, as a result of this type of work, in the recent news now, I've been moving into some research leadership work. And uh, thanks to an uh, Aero alum, John Gedmark, one of the founders of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. And um, there's some fun stories uh, about how rude I was to John when he was trying to get me involved, and he kept calling back. Um, so in 2009, I became a member of the uh, original member of the Suborbital Applications Researchers Group of Commercial Space Life Federation, group of researchers in very diverse fields that uh, do advocacy in the capital uh, for the industry. I have a part of that. I've testified to the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Science, Space, and Competitiveness um, on research and educational impact of these, this new industry. Uh, a member of the Science and Technology Advisory Panel for CASIS. Who knows what CASIS is? They're on half of the space station as a national laboratory. Um, but they had to give up the NASA name, so they lost the best brand name in history, and now nobody knows who they are. Um, and just began on the uh, Committee on Biolo Physical and Biological Sciences in Space from the National Academies, in which I have the great pleasure of overseeing Professor Dumbacher's newest job. So that uh, will be interesting. Um, here's uh, three quarters of Sarg, Sarge, a year ago at a meeting we had. Uh, yeah, that's an F-104. There's about a dozen of them left flying. Uh, some rich guy in Florida has them as a hobby. Uh, we were in the hangar. So there's two Purdue alums in this picture. Professors, maybe you remember uh, Jane Kinney in the, uh, the royal blue on my, uh, was that on my right there? Or to the, to the left of me? Um, she's now Assistant Director of Commercial Space Flight Federation in D.C. And on the other side of me is Charlie Walker. Um, when I was a student, an undergrad at Michigan, I wanted to grow up to be Charlie. He was a McDonnell Douglas astronaut. Flew three times in shuttle, never worked for NASA. I thought that was going to be so cool, the space age we were moving into a space shuttle, that companies would have their own astronauts. And so it's a great joy to work with Charlie. And anybody who knows Charlie would know that. I, I really mean that, that he is great to work with uh, on this committee. Here's my uh, Senate testimony. Oh, look at that name in front, Mr. Hale, Wayne Hale. Uh, very um, honored uh, mechanical engineering graduate from Purdue, was in charge of uh, much of the space shuttle operations. Patty Grace Smith was uh, formerly uh, director of FAA Commercial Space Transportation. At this moment, she was a high-paid consultant in DC. I, I, I read we lost her last year. She passed on. Uh, Michael Lopez Alegria, Navy fighter pilot, astronaut. At that point, he was president of Commercial Space Flight Federation, and then little old me. This was a surreal experience um, and intimidating. Uh, but I think my oral PhD exam at Stanford Oral PhD qualifying exam at Stanford was still more stressful than this. Gus, you remember Beth? Uh, I mentioned Mike Moses was president of Virgin Galactic. Beth Moses is director of astronaut training for Virgin Galactic. I was out at the rollout last February of their new spaceship, and uh, that was an exciting time. So in this advocacy role, what do we do? Well, we meet with Senate staffers, House staffers, Office of Management and Budget staff, NASA headquarters, FAA headquarters, really to encourage our government, give advice when asked, um, and to help them to avoid regulating this nascent industry out of business. Uh, flight safety is an important thing. Even uh, people in the vehicle, people on the ground, people living nearby um, who just want to get up and go to work every morning and come home and not have rockets fall on their houses. Um, so it, it is a complex problem. And also this issue of we have thousands of aircraft flying this way, right, all over the country. And now all of a sudden, a half dozen people want to start flying this way. 
Um, that's a non-trivial problem. Uh, and so we are there to, uh, Sarge is there in, in the Capitol once a year or twice a year to, you know, be the researchers, uh, the, the users of these vehicles who want to uh, have this thing happen. And it's very refreshing how often uh, congressional staffers will thank us for coming by that, uh, that we don't often get to talk to people who aren't like so tied in with the business and they, they appreciate our input. When I do advocacy in my science world, I hear things like, uh, I don't do anything in space. Aren't people going to die? Those rockets are just rich guys' toys. Hasn't NASA done this? And then the last one. So this is kind of my second surprise lesson in how researchers sometimes don't like new ideas. To answer some of these, yes, you have not done anything in space because getting to space has been very expensive and long, lengthy and difficult. Now you can go to the store, so to speak, and buy space flight, suborbital space flight. So now you can do many things in space that you couldn't do before. Aren't people going to die? Well, um, people die on the highways. But not all these rockets are human vehicles. So like the Armadillo one I showed you, it's, it's an unmanned vehicle. Um, and people who choose to ride these rockets are taking a, a risk like you take when you, you do many things. Uh, people die climbing Mount Everest, and they choose to take on that risk every year. So it, it could happen, but it's not anything terribly unique. These rockets are just rich guys' toys. These flat screens we love, at one point these were rich guys' toys. Now we all have them, and we love them. <coughs> if the billionaires and millionaires want to capitalize the construction of a new laboratory for me, why is that a bad thing, right? So, and no, NASA hasn't done this already. NASA has done sounding rockets, certainly, and European Space Agency has, and, and still do some, but this is going to be uh, a lot more frequent. And that. So let's revisit this path thing, what Professor Driscoll told me, and I ran away from the two-phase flows, right? What did I show you I'm working on, slide after slide? So Professor Driscoll was right, and it's probably still good advice 35 years later to students. If you become an expert in two-phase flows, you'll never be short of work. I went to uh, Driscoll for advice, and Professor Driscoll like uttered an oracle, which I couldn't escape my destiny. Uh, so most of what I do now is two-phase flow. So to conclude, there's those two themes I launched at the start, right? I do my best work with other people. And to me, at Purdue, research and teaching are so overlapping, I really don't know how to separate them. And I wish people would stop asking us, talking to us, talking about them as separate things. Um, there's a lesson that researchers can miss out on new ideas if we get into the habit of defining ourselves based on our current tightly focused research and say, I don't do that, I don't do this. Um, you can miss out on new ideas, or if you're stuck with the canonical uh, models and, and methods uh, in, in, in the field. Uh, I got around that by switching from sprays to zero gravity fluids and uh, just charged ahead. Um, and here at Purdue, we get to do leading edge aerospace research while living in a small town, and that is really cool. Uh, the example I put here, I think of frequently not this month, but in the warmer months when I go and walk nine holes of golf early in the morning. And the time it takes me to do that is a commute in LA. Okay. Uh, plus we have great schools for our kids. We don't need 50 year mortgages. Um, there's, I, I'm really happy uh, being here and we have great alums. I've talked about a few of them and I want to finally conclude with a very sincere thank you to every colleague, student, staff, alum, whoever th that I've worked with, because if you go back to that bullet up there, I, I do my best work with other people. So thank you very much.
a wonderful uh, lecture and for all you've done for oh. the department and the, its students over a quarter century and more. I think we have time for a few questions if uh, the audience would like. And thanks for stepping in. I told uh, our department had, had to leave town. I told him that's okay. I knew he was providing an open bar here. So when he gets back, just play along and thank him for it. <laughs> So what lies ahead? You know, um, it's, it's very interesting. I've uh, long wanted to be principal investigator on an orbital experiment. And I got that with fluids education. But then it got canceled before we got to orbit. But I designed part of uh, an important two parts of CFE. But I, you know, that's enough, it turns out. I'm not obsessed now with becoming a PI on yet another experiment that may or may not get up there. Space Station and I could end our research careers at similar years. ISS isn't going to last forever. <laughs> Neither am I. Um, so I see a lot more suborbital work. Um, we can do a lot more. Right, you only get three minutes and it's maybe a, a millage rather than hour after hour of maybe a micro G in space station, but gosh, you can go and you can buy it and you can do it and um, second graders can do it and I can do it time and time again. Uh, it's about $50,000 for um, something uh, this size in commercial suborbital instead of several million in the old rockets. So it's a huge change in how we can do business. Uh, so I see in the future more and more uh, suborbital, and I think there's still work that could be done um, really in support of risk reduction in orbital commercial space flight, too, that uh, we have many experts in specific physical topics at Purdue that have some overlap with that world, and that if we can couple into the satellite owner and operator and insurer's uh, industry that we could... Uh, have some good work going for a number of years here. Uh, I see some young colleagues like Xiao Shui. As I was putting this together, I uh, found myself thinking, I wish I had photographs of my grad students from 25 years ago. Of course, that was with film back then. That's why we didn't do it. But that's just a little okay. into you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wish I Yeah, it works, you know. Well, it's, uh, I don't know, in the older days we didn't... Uh, count so much about who were you a co were you a co-advisor on the student or not it's like well just do the work you know fun work let's do it